Next up, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first panel of the day. This will be moderated by IEB Europe's Public Policy Manager, Ines Talavera de la Esperanza, who, was, who will um, discuss with the panel all the latest information you need to know on the DSA um, so that we can move forward. Ines, please join me on stage and welcome your panel. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to this panel discussion on the Digital Services Act, an important topic that holds significant relevance in today's digital landscape. I am Ines Talavera, as it has said already, and I am from IB Europe. And I am honored, of course, to introduce our um, distinguished panelists, starting with Enrique Factor Santoveña, representing the Spanish Data Protection Authority, the IEPD. Joining us from the French Regulatory Authority for Audiovisual and Digital Communication, and now also the French Digital Services Coordinator, we have Benoit Lutret. <laughs> and lastly, we are privileged to have Irene Roche Laguna, the Deputy Head at the European Commission Unit F2 at the Directorate General for Communications, Networks, Content and Technology. <laughs> Welcome. Um, before we delve into the panel discussion, I just want to announce that we also will count with five minutes for questions. So if you are listening to this panel discussion, please hold that question in your mind and we'll, we will have a minute for your question afterwards. Um, now let's turn our attention to the subject matter at hand. Today, our focus will be on the implementation of the DSA. Um, the DSA came into force in November 2022 and actually will be directly applicable across the EU and will apply as of February 2024. For VLOPS, the story will be a bit different and will apply a bit sooner in summer 2023. The DSA aims to establish standard rules on transparency and accountability for online platforms across the single market. And of particular interest, and especially for our audience, is Article 26 um, regarding obligations for online platforms and these uh, further obligations that will require transparency requirements. Um, and also, we have to take into account that one of the crucial things of the DSA will be the effective and consistent enforcement of the DSA. And now that we have present today all of you regulators, um, it will require the collaboration and cooperation between you all. So thank you, and let's begin with our panel discussion. I'm gonna start with you, Benoit. Enforcing this regulation will be a shared responsibility among the European Commission, the digital services coordinators in each member state, and supporting national authorities, such as the data protection authorities. On the new regulators, the digital services coordinators, Member states will have until February 2024 to appoint DSCs. And ACOM has been one of the first of being appointed. Um, Benoit, as part of ACOM, can you give us some background on why your authority was chosen and what ACOM's role will be? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, two weeks ago, the French government uh, uh, made public uh, its proposal uh, to how we are going to implement the DSA in France. So they have picked uh, three agencies. Uh, the consumer agency uh, to deal with uh, the marketplace feature of the DSA. Uh, the DDPR regulator, CNIL, uh, to deal with the specific requirement which constrain how you can uh, uh, use uh, personal data uh, because of course there is a clear logic uh, to, to have the GDPR regulator having full oversight on that, and it will be the, make the life of platform easier. And for the rest of the regulation, requested uh, ARCOM uh, to, to get ready to be the digital service coordinator. Uh, it was uh, pretty logic from uh, one point of view, the fact that we, use, we are used to be a media regulator, so we are used to regulate uh, in the informational space 
where you have to intervene, but more importantly, you have to protect freedom of speech, freedom of communication. So this is in our culture. Part of the DSA is trying to address issues which are disinformation, uh, hate speech, uh, which are really linked to how do you operate in the media environment, and also how do you operate with uh, the advertising industry, which is, of course, at the heart of the media industry, be it uh, traditional media or digital media. So from that point of view, it was obvious. At the same time, it's also a challenge, because clearly uh, it's a uh, the DSA has a very wide scope, in a way, we are also becoming a regulator of the online safety on the internet. So we are going through that learning curve and uh, uh, we are getting ready to, to do that. Uh, I will just add that uh, for us, it's really a, a nice adventure because we have to reinvent how we operate as a regulator. We are not being appointed as a French regulator for the DSA. We are being appointed as a French coordinator in the AU network of regulators that will implement the DSA. So this, it's really a complete change of mind. We have to think that we are really a, a member of a network of regulators. The closest thing to that is uh, how the, the, the central bank are operating with a network of central banks across Europe with the AU central bank at the center. That's the first thing. Second thing is interesting, this word coordinator. It's not a regulator. And it really reflects the fact that in the DSA, you are trying to regulate the digital space where you have everything. You find all the issues we have in our society in the real life, you find them back on the digital space. And you have to open the regulation to everybody to participate in, to make it a success, while protecting our democratic values. So I think the, the, the word coordinator is important. I think that's a great answer. I was actually going to ask you about the challenges and opportunities, but you have described it very well already. So we are going to move forward, but still with you, Benoit. Um, regarding online advertising and transparency requirements, are there any other regulatory bodies that will support ARCOM's job? So, of course, uh, for, we will work, uh, the, the core team will be working with uh, CNIL, the French GDPR regulator, with DGCCRF, the consumer agency, at the national level. And then, of course, we will involve, we expect to involve the industry, which is strategic. There is no regulation without the industry. We have great hope. We are happy to see that uh, IAB France is now being called uh, Alliance uh, Digital, and we expect to work with them uh, closely and uh, we'll hold the industry. And, of course, again, the first coordination will be our peers at EU level, because we will not invent anything in France, at least that's the objective. Mm -hmm. We invent collectively at the EU level, and then we implement in a coordinated way. So our first uh, counterparts are critical. That's why, in fact, uh, I'm traveling a lot to Dublin to meet with uh, mm -hmm. the new D Irish DSC to Germany, and I hope to come back in Madrid to meet with a uh, Spanish regulator as soon as possible. That sounds good. And related to this, actually, how would you make sure there is a collaboration across different authorities involved in enforcement in France? Uh, I'm sorry. How would you make sure there is a collaboration across the authorities in France as ARCOM? You know, it's very hard to, to <laughs> understand because the echo. sound is good on that side. Yeah, not maybe it's not as nice the sound. Is. Um, so I was asking if you are going to how you are going to make sure that it is a collaboration ongoing between ARCOM and the other competent authorities in France? Uh, well, typically, first, <coughs> we realized over the last years that uh, in the digital world, uh, you have to work very closely uh, among all the regulators. So we now have a culture very well established, at least between the, the national regulators. Uh, we work a lot with the telecommunication regulator when we are trying to minimize the uh, environmental impact. Uh, the French parliament is voting laws after laws saying both regulators have to work together to see how collectively we can reduce uh, the impact uh, of the whole digital uh, uh, ecosystem on the environment. We are used to work with the competition authority because whenever we have an issue of competition, they ask us our opinion, we ask them their opinion. Uh, and now uh, we are seeing uh, over the last two years that the number of issues which uh, get us to work with the GDPR regulator is mm -hmm. increasing every month. Yeah. Uh, so we are used now to, uh, to have uh, regular meetings 
uh, whenever, typically, we launched a public consultation one year ago, it was in advance, in fact, of the DSA, and how would you, how would you, what are the difficulty we should uh, anticipate to uh, implement the access of academics to the data of social networks, which is a very important part of the DSA. Before launching the public consultation, we, we send it to the GDPR regulator saying, mm -hmm. we want to work with you. What do you think? Uh, how, and they reviewed uh, our public consultation. Yeah. So now it's really, uh, I guess, uh, uh, a something very natural. The digital world can seem highly complex. It's complex and to the extent that uh, you try to work vertically uh, with used to work. And more and more we're taking the initiative of working on a very horizontal basis and just discuss across the board with all the in involved partners. I think it's great that you mentioned the data protection authorities, because now my question is to Enrique. Um, of course, the data protection authorities, we already know that they are going to play a crucial role for the DSA implementation. And for you, Enrique, um, under the DSA, can you provide some insights under how the situation is going to be in Spain? <laughs> I really wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, the thing is that uh, w the Spanish government haven't decided on which uh, authority will take care of the uh, DSA, will be the coordinator of the, of the DSA, so uh, we don't really know what the decision will, uh, will take the, the government and due to the political situation it will maybe take a while <laughs> until the, the new government probably uh, came. Uh, but in any case, from the uh, Spanish uh, Data Protection Authority, we are ready to collaborate to, with uh, any uh, authority that the, the government decides, uh, because we see that the DSA, the implementation, it uh, brings a lot of uh, challenges, and it's, uh, uh, it's going to be a, a full impact. On, on all our lives, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think uh, that we need to, to collaborate in order to protect the fundamental rights. Uh, and in our case, the fundamental right of, for, for the protection of personal data. Definitely. And I think actually the European Commission is going to play a crucial role. So I think a very good question that we are all wondering here is um, how the Commission is going to make sure that um, all the rules can be fully implemented by the beginning of the year. And this related to what are other preparations that the Commission is undertaking and how is it supporting the member states and the industry? Yeah, thank you for, for that question. Um, first of all, I, I think it's clear for everyone that uh, this is a complicated matter to coordinate uh, at national level and at European level. The DSA uh, is a horizontal instrument. During the negotiations, we could have had a, a drink game every time that we said horizontal because it came across as, as one of the main characteristics and the challenges in terms of uh, legislating the space. Even if we like talking about the Wild West, the, the internet and the digital space is already heavily regulated at national level. I mean, France has already around a dozen of, uh, of uh, laws that have been passed legislating uh, online platforms in particular, but also at European level we have data protection, but al also consumer protection, uh, terrorist content, uh, copyright, audiovisual, and the DSA does not substitute, obviously, all this legislation, it will have to coexist and there is a, a strong need for coordination. And this was already uh, in the mind of the Commission and in the mind of the co-legislator also. So there is a need for coordination at national level, Benoit and Kike have spoken about that. But at European level, we will have the board, the DSA board, where all uh, national coordinators will sit down together. And depending on the agenda, on the topics that will be discussed, the coordinator will come accompanied by the given authority that it's uh, responsible. If it's a data protection issue or an advertising issue, then uh, the data protection authorities would mm -hmm. play a, a, a role in, in that meeting. But also, there is the possibility, as much as in the DMA, um, there is a high-level group 
that uh, gathers all the different regulators of different uh, topics that surround the, the platform economy, also in the DSA. It's not written in the operative part, but in the recitals it's also included in the, in the spirit of the DSA that the board can and should cooperate with other uh, union bodies, other uh, um, union um, organiz organizations of uh, regulators like the EDPB, like ERGA, etc. So there is room for further coordination to be sure that we are all aligned. So, and, and now in terms of preparation in the Commission, we are heavily investing time in helping member states. We have regular meetings in our expert group, in the, the DSA committee, also informal gathering, visiting, having bilaterals with the member states to be sure that they are all on time. Member states have until February next year to appoint the digital services coordinator and we want to be sure that it is operative, that it's independent, that everything follows the, the rules under the DSA. And in my view, uh, we can be quite optimistic because we feel that member states share this need, uh, this sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. We are also obviously working closely together with the designated very large online platforms and search engines. We have had a first batch of designations uh, as, late as uh, end April. And we are opening dialogues with them to prepare, to help them prepare compliance. They will have to comply with the DSA already by the end of the summer. So this, yep. is, this is around the corner, so to speak. For all other uh, service providers that are not very large online platforms but will be in scope, we are also uh, targeting them, even though I have to say in this uh, room that it's always difficult to come to the industry in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, are, there are means, we are organizing workshops, there will be a public event on the 27th of June where we will cover all different aspects that are covered by the DSA and we will also uh, try to get the views through more uh, formal and informal channels in any event. But uh, we are, uh, finally, we are also working towards the need for guidance. Obviously, guidance is something, or guidelines come after some period where there, there are some challenges in terms of implementation. There is case law, and, and there is where the Commission usually issues uh, guidance. But in the DSA, we see that there is some need, for instance, uh, in, in the article that relates to, to protection of minors mm -hmm. uh, as regards uh, also advertising. And uh, last but not least, the need for templates for transparency reporting, because this is also a possibility for the Commission to, to issue templates, mm -hmm. and this is something that we are working towards. Definitely. As we mentioned before, Article 26 will be the most important article for the advertising industry. And now that we have here Enrique, I wanted to ask, um, for and also for the benefit of the audience today, as many people are arriving a bit new to the DSA, uh, could you explain the difference between the GDPR requirements regarding transparency and the DSA's transparency requirements under Article 26? In a brief manner, you don't have to go into the details of it. Well, uh both uh, DSA and, and GDPR are uh, based on the uh, protection of the fundamental rights enshrined in the in the Charter of, of uh, Fundamental Rights for European Fundamental Rights, and uh, they share a lot of uh, uh, practicalities. It's, there is a risk uh, assessment. There are code of conducts. There are uh, a lot of. Um, similarities between uh, the enforcement, especially of the uh, GDPR and the uh, DSA. There is a heavy inspiration, I would say, from the from GDPR. But the, probably the, the two main differences that I have found so far in the, in the, in between G, uh, GDPR and DSA is first the um, granularity that DSA brings. It's uh, GDPR is a general uh, regulation that affects everyone and all the all the uh, treatments. 
but uh, the DSA is more uh, adapted to the actual uh, internet as, as we know it today. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are main differences between uh, uh, small enterprises or normal <coughs> providers and very large providers. Uh, there are different requirements for different levels of, of, of these uh, of this type of, of uh, companies. And the other main difference I will mm, say is the, the active uh, intervention and participation of the uh, Commission, the European Commission, uh, as a, uh, in the GDPR, everything is based on uh, national enforcement, national authorities, mm -hmm. but uh, the DSA, it's more based on the work and the uh, analysis of the commission. That I would say that those are the two main differences between the DSA and, and GDPR, as far as uh, I, I have uh, read it. Yeah, I think, well, that's actually very enlightening. And we are going to stick a bit with the Article 26, because I also want to hear your views, Irene. And transparency obligations. In a nutshell, what are your main expectations towards the industry to make sure to comply with Article 26? I did not understand. Oh. <laughs> Maybe my microphone? There is a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I was asking if you could explain in a nutshell, what are your main expect expectations towards the compliance with Article 26 with the industry? Sure, uh, this is a very good question because uh, obviously for us it's uh, important that the industry plays a role. Uh, the DSA uh, brings uh, a lot of opportunities in our view um, for industry, for other stakeholders, but also for civil society, for users at the end of the day. So from the Commission we try to promote that all these stakeholders and also the industry come to us and play the role that they make use of the rights that are created by the DSA, also the use of the transparency that it is offered. Mm -hmm. So otherwise transparency for the sake of transparency does not bring much. So the, there has to be a, a result. And uh, from that point of view, in the Commission we are very much <coughs> hoping that the industry will take over that role and will come to us uh, by means of uh, complaints, by means of uh, reports, by means of studies, uh, via the, the access to data by researchers. So this is uh, something that uh, we think are some, some hooks that the DSA includes for all the, the, the society at large mm -hmm. to play their role, otherwise, uh, I don't think anyone will expect the Commission to solve all the problems in the digital uh, economy by ourselves. This is, uh, this is our point of view in, in that regard. Of course. And, well, a bit related to this, but moving through the landscape of more uh, VLOPs, regarding them, um, what about their expectations toward VLOPs? What are the expectations from the Commission towards VLOPs in compliance? that they comply. <laughs> I think uh, this, is, this is the first expectation. They need to change the way they act. And, and I think they are very much uh, aligned with, uh, with that. I, actually, I don't think that VLOPs, uh, in any event, those that have been designated already, um, are against regulation. They are against fragmented. Uh, a fragmented space that they have 27 um, regulated uh, systems in Europe and uh, that they have to, to deal with all these differences. So we feel that there is also from their perspective uh, a need for, for this regulation. Mm -hmm. So our expectation is that they play their part, that, that there is a, a, a constant regulatory dialogue I mean, the Commission now turns into the regulator role and it is not about always using the stick. We need to enter into a dialogue and, and to make these uh, obligations turn into, into something specific and a benefit for the, for the user. Yeah. Well, that I think makes a lot of sense. Um, and as the implementation date of the DSA is coming very near, 
Um, could you elaborate on the strategies that maybe the Commission is thinking of in terms of educating the people, educating also companies in the, um, that the DSA is in place and that it exists? Yes, I, I think this is a, a very important point because we feel that uh, in the Brussels bubble everyone knows about the DSA. The DSA is already an acronym that uh, has become uh, very useful, but when I go to my place of origin and I talk with my family, the DSA is, uh, well, the GDPR has become already something more popular and also uh, outside Europe, the DSA still needs to, to make this way. And in that, uh, in, in, in that aspect, the role of civil society, I think it's important, of uh, civil rights organizations, of consumer organizations, that they need also to, to help us pass the message and to make everyone aware that they now have their rights. They can report illegal content. If they can't, they have to tell someone, sorry, I can't. The, I, I found uh, two weeks ago uh, some, other, some listing in Wallapop in Spain and there was no uh, reporting mechanism. So this is something that will have to be there when the DSA is in place. Yeah. And this is just one example, the, the possibility to complain, to challenge uh, content moderation decisions. This is, uh, it sounds simple, but it's quite revolutionary. Yeah. And if people do not make use of their rights, it's use it or lose it in a way. So I think uh, it, there is a need for, for broader uh, explanation of what the DSA entails. Definitely. We are arriving at the end of the panel, and I wanted to ask you all a question. Um, as the industry, we are finding our ways to comply, especially the advertising industry, uh, in regards to Article 26. And we are all wondering what is the preferred way for you, for the industry, to consult with you, to interact with you, and to have a conversation openly about Article 26 and the expectations that have to be met. So maybe we can start with you, Benoit. I hope I have understood the question. <laughs> um, <coughs> you know, for me, the DSA is really uh, a text of uh, next generation compared to e-commerce on uh, GDPR. And it's trying to combine two things which are critical. How do you allow the platform industry, and very close to the platform industry is a digital advertisement industry, to operate at scale? And to operate at scale, you need to have EU standard at least, because you don't want to industrialize on a national basis. But DSA is also about organizing uh, the accountability of both industries on member state level. And uh, that's why we need to have those two levels and to keep some flexibility. Uh, I realize typically uh, that in France, we'll have to see how we deal with uh, climate change like everywhere. But the strategy will differ from each member state because typically we don't have the same energy, energy mix. So we made commitment to reduce our emission of carbon, but they are different in all member states. So we will come back in each member state with different requests to the adv advertising industry, to the platform industry. And DSA allows this kind of flexibility. The hard law regulation which will which allow you to operate at industrial level, at EU level. But then the DSA also allow soft law regulation through voluntary commitment. Part of it will be done at EU level, part of it will be done at national level. And that we, so we expect to, to have this kind of interaction, always trying to make sure, okay, should we start this discussion maybe in France, but move it very fast at the EU level, or no? Is it a discussion that should be done within the French politics with soft law regulation? Does it answer your question? I think yes. <laughs> okay. And maybe we can <laughs> follow up with you. <laughs> All right. Uh, about the interaction with the, with the industry? Is that the... the yeah, the expectations. And also like the preferred way for you as the DPA, for the industry to interact or to consult with you on Article 26, maybe, you know, informal meetings in another way that you can imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe it's a, a 
we are not the main the main uh, uh, authority for the for the implementation of DSA. Uh, we have a kind of a lateral uh, approach to that. But uh, in any case, we uh, as a authority, a national authority, we engage with uh, uh, industry in general. We, we take uh, steps to approach them, and uh, we are an open. Uh, authority that uh, welcomes anyone that has uh, an idea. We participated uh, in some sandboxes and uh, also we created a, with EIB the uh, guide for, for, for cookies and I think that was a very interesting uh, collaboration with, uh, with, uh, with this uh, industry. So uh, our idea is to keep uh, promoting uh, and keep uh, uh, welcoming all the all the approaches and mm -hmm. trying to uh, contact with with them with the industry uh, not very intense because it's not our main main point i will also highlight the uh, european approach for this uh, the uh, spanish authority as part of the european data protection board uh, also uh, participate in the in in some uh, expert groups, and yesterday I was in in Brussels in the uh, expert group for social media of the European Data Protection Board, and uh, is this is the um, group that they will take care of the all the uh, relations with the DCA, DSA, and uh, well we are starting working on that. And we are planning for a, a harmonized approach of all the uh, uh, authorities on, on data protection. And uh, I'm sure that we can find uh, venues for uh, collaboration and exchange information with, with industry that is affected by the DCA. So uh, we are working at two levels, a national level, but also a European level. I guess for now, for Spain, it's a bit more challenging since the digital services coordinator is still not very clear at the end who's going to be appointed, not yet. So maybe in a few months we can come back to this conversation, and I'm sure you will also have more clarity on the topic. And lastly, Irene? Yep, uh, I would like to, to, to mention something that Benoit has already uh, referred to, and it's the soft law, and, and, and the DSA it's not only quite a long piece of hard law, it also includes uh, important hooks for soft law. It is technologically neutral, at least uh, as, a, as a draft team uh, leader, I, I tend to believe it. I think it's future-proof, but it needs to, to be alive. And, and there is a possibility to, to enter into multi-stakeholder dialogues in the context of codes of conduct. It's not only self-regulation, we like calling it co-regulation because it will be under uh, strong um, scrutiny by the regulators at European and national level in the board. And there is where we see uh, a huge uh, opportunity for the industry to play a role. We have seen it in the code of practice for this information. It's not, uh, it takes two at least to tango, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's not only the problem of platforms. It, this is something that brings a lot uh, of uh, stakeholders and the whole community to try to find uh, solutions. So uh, we think that this is important to stress and to, to continue feeding the possibility to <coughs> continue cooperating with, uh, with the industry in, in many layers in the, in the context of the DSA. Also for the platforms that are not very large, mm. because uh, we are all focusing on the very large online platforms, on the risk uh, assessment, risk mitigation measures, audits, research, access to data, etc. But the, the platform economy is much broader than that. Of course. And there is where we would need to bring them also, saying, well, this is a club. This is a privileged club where uh, the user can feel safe and the user can feel protected also. So why not joining the, the team via codes of conduct or via uh, other kinds of, uh, of solutions? I think this is great also because in our audience we have every single size of ad tech. So 
and think they will be very interested in knowing that they can, of course, engage with the European Commission and learn a bit more about the compliance with the DSA. Um, I don't know how we're doing with time, but actually I wanted to open now for questions, if anyone has in the public. Ben Barokas from uh, SourcePoint. We provide data privacy <coughs> technology to the advertising ecosystem. And I was interested in, in hearing uh, your interpretation of what constitutes a platform under uh, Article 26 and how big of a enterprise needs to be concerned uh, with, with providing the detailed transparency that you, you talked about earlier. I don't know if you were able to hear it. It's, I don't know, it's a bit low. Maybe you can repeat the, the question again once more, sorry. Sure, is it better now? I don't want to be too loud. Yeah, now um, it's way better. I, I was interested in understanding in terms of um, how the interpretation of how big a platform, uh, I think there are a lot of publishers in the, in the, in the room that would be interested to understand if they're selling advertising for, for any size uh, enterprise, does that mean that they have to adhere to all those levels of transparency? Yeah, I think he's asking more about the concept of, the, of what is an online platform, apart from VLOPs. I think this is actually mm -hmm. a very commonly asked question in, in our association. As you are saying, not only there are existing VLOPs, there are way more, and maybe you can set a bit more light on, on the concept of online platforms. Sure. Yeah, thank you, and sorry, because there is a strong echo, and it's difficult to, to understand. Uh, indeed, the DSA is not only about the Googles and Facebook, and um, who knows, maybe in 10 years' time, there will not be uh, the same platforms that we have today. If we look at the Internet of 20 years ago, there are many names that that people do not use anymore. Uh, the DSA tends to cover the space by defining the categories, the technical uh, features of a given service. So any service that hosts content at the request of the user and disseminates to the public, then it's a platform. And this could uh, also be translated into the metaverse or some Thing that will come in the in the next future, and the the specific impact of the very large online platforms of the section that uh, refers to the systemic risk brought by the very large ones is only one part of it. But one of those designated services maybe will become less popular in, in the next future because our children our children do not use it, and they will become the adults in a couple of years and. It will not become too popular. So they will step back, but they, it does not mean that they will not continue being regulated. They will continue being subject to obligations of uh, diligence, of transparency, protected from liability for third party content, regardless of the size or reach, and many other obligations that are also there to protect the user. I don't know if that replied the question. I think Benoit also wants to complement. Uh, I guess. For me, the DSA is just a continuation of e-commerce. If you were not concerned by e-commerce, if you are a publisher, if you claim editorial responsibility, normally you are not concerned by DSA. If you were already in the e-commerce scope, if you were claiming to be a host, definitely you, you are concerned by the DSA and you should wonder whether among the hosts, you are now not only a host, but also a platform. And basically for me, the acid test is if you claim to have a limited liability under e-commerce, definitely you should look at the DSA because the DSA is about protecting this limited liability of hosts while organizing a greater accountability. For me, it's really the test. So, but some publishers are in entering new areas, so may enter territories where they should ask uh, some questions. 
But it's the basic question for me is what kind of responsibility are you claiming? If you are claiming responsibility for the content, or publisher in the traditional sense, not concerned by DSA. If you are saying you want to claim the limited liability, you are entering the DSA territory. What do you think, Irene? Would you agree? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have to stress that it is not conditional <laughs> that they would still be protected from liability. Yes. But if they don't comply with the due diligence obligations, then they are in breach of the DSA, indeed. I don't know if there is more questions in the public. Okay. Hi, can you hear me okay? Let's see. <laughs> so, so, okay. I actually have two questions. Um, Greg Mluczkowski from Amazon. Um, so you've described the multi-layered, multi-stakeholder um, enforcement system. One of the main criticism of GDPR in terms of enforcement is um, speed of the um, speed of um, resolution of cases. And so I wonder um, how this um, complex infrastructure um, will impact the timing. Um, and the speed of um, enforcement. And then the second question, um, you've been um, highlighting the importance of providing information to the researchers and um, access to, um, to, to, to data, um, including on advertising also to the public. Um, so I wonder in thinking about the ad libraries, um, would we or would the public at large benefit from being able to systematically review advertising from across the web Thank you. I am not sure if you could hear <laughs> correctly or not. Yeah. No, I, I would like to, to, and thank you for, for this good question. I think uh, the speed is, uh, we, we have to manage expectations because it doesn't matter how agile the, the regulation or the solutions are, we, we will need to build a strong case. We cannot shoot from the hip. And it, it is the same in competition cases. It will be the same under the DMA and it will be the same under the DSA. So speed, I think there will be speed. There will be um, early action in this dialogue that I mentioned that we will try to anticipate problems instead of trying to solve problems via enforcement. And I think the, the fact that uh, the Commission has been given this, uh, this exclusive powers for the very large online platforms and that there will be a, a, a definite number of those platforms and we will have to, to build this uh, bilateral uh, relationship will help us targeting and, and, and tailor a, a solution before we have to uh, either uh, establish a, an enforcement uh, measure. But this is something that uh, we need to build, and I cannot promise that all the problems will, solve, will be solved. It will also depend on the willingness of those uh, designated entities to, to, to play the game. And I, also for the anecdotes, uh, we have compared during this panel the GDPR with the DSA. Uh, you have asked about lessons learned. It is very interesting because if you look at the Commission proposal of the GDPR, we were uh, proposing the Commission to play this role and the Council said, no, no, no. Member States, uh, the regulatory authorities will do it. In the DSA, the Commission proposal was very much inspired by the existing systems, not only in the GDPR, but also in the CPC regulation, in the AVMSD, in, in all this... Uh, uh, other instruments, and the Council told us, no, 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 the Commission has to play this exclusive role because we need to move faster. So now we are there, we are prepared, we are, we are ready, but uh, I also want to manage uh, expectations on, in that regard. I don't know if Benoit or Enrique want to complement a bit the answer. Maybe I, on the question of tra on transparency of uh, the ad li li library, I think it's a very interesting feature, uh, which will be, have a tremendous benefit because uh, it's typically an example where you have a hard regulation. The DSA imposes envelopes to set up repository with all the digital ads has to be put in it with some uh, very Im important information. Uh, in a coordinated way, interoperable way that will be uh, organized by the Commission. 
that's a marvelous basis to build soft regulation. Soft regulation usually is difficult, especially on digital advertisement, because there's too much of an asymmetry of information. So some lawmakers may say, well, let's have some very high, clear cut, uh, hard regulation. Uh, but we, we expect that because we'll have those ad, uh, li libraries uh, of all the ads, it will be a very good basis to build clever soft regulation, uh, soft law regulation, much more efficient uh, to, to, to achieve a given result. So we are already starting thinking how we can change the dynamic of typically how we discuss uh, uh, food, uh, food charter, how do we implement them in a clever way and how can we go further in demonstrating that these kind of instruments are efficient uh, for everybody and really deliver something while maintaining the cost under control for the industries. Well, thank you. I don't know if there is any final question. If not, we can close the panel. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all our panelists. The discussion has been lovely. And before we just finalize, because the next speakers are waiting for us, I would like to take this opportunity to inform of IBIS Europe work on the DSA. Actually, we have been um, creating, we created a task force that we included both experts in policy and also from the technical side. And we have been discussing on how to comply with Article 26 since summer 2022. And actually, uh, we have the objective of releasing a minimum viable product, an industry approach that will promote transparency in light with Article 26. And this MVP that is being developed, and this is still very much ongoing work, and there is a lot uh, still to, to be doing, will consist of a standardized protocol for industry participants to collaborate for the purpose of compiling and delivering DSA required as transparency information. This approach is basically acknowledging that sometimes, in many cases, the information required to be disclosed to consumers by online platforms is held by upstream parties such as vendors. And by establishing a standardized approach, we aim to streamline the flow of information, ensuring that crucial transparency details are effectively transmitted to the entities responsible for compliance with the DSA's transparency requirements. As we are doing this collaborative effort, we are also trying to engage with policymakers in parallel, just because we need, and it's crucial for us, to make sure that this mechanism will be capable to meet expectations. And ending with this, I reiterate an open invitation to all our membership to join this DSA task force and keep on working on, on this standardized protocol. So thank you all. <laughs>